I want to introduce you to one of the most incredible landscapes on Earth. So, look around. You'll see trees as tall as skyscrapers towering above you, and more shades of green than you knew existed. An endless variety of plants covering every inch of the forest floor. Fallen, rotting trees giving way to new life and becoming entire ecosystems of their own. Rivers and streams slowly carving canyons thousands of feet into the earth. You'll hear the sounds of hundreds of species of animals living here, and the seemingly constant rain that makes this place tick. This is an old growth forest, an untouched pocket of temperate rainforest in coastal Oregon, home to some of the largest and oldest trees in the US. I am obsessed with these landscapes. They're lush, rainy, moody, right up my alley. If you visited one, you'll understand the powerful and indescribable feeling that they evoke. And if you haven't, this might be your last chance. I came here to find out why these ancient forests are disappearing and why it's so important that we hold on to what's left of them. Okay, so first of all, what even makes a forest old growth in the first place? And well, I don't know. There technically isn't a universally agreed upon definition for what makes a forest old growth. Depending on who you ask, it could be based just on tree age, like if a forest is at least 150 years old, then it's considered old growth. Or it could be defined by ecological qualities like the size of the trees, accumulation of large dead wood on the forest floor, and the biodiversity of plants and trees. It's a little silly, but the lack of agreement just around that simple definition is one of the things that makes it difficult to measure and research old growth forests and also makes it tough for them to qualify for protection against logging. When it comes to old growth forests in the Northwest, there's one type of tree that you hear mentioned all the time, the Douglas fir. What kind of fantastic trees have you got growing around here? Big, majestic. Douglas firs. It's the most common type of tree in Oregon, and if you've ever had a Christmas tree, there's a good chance that it was a Douglas fir. Now, Christmas trees are young, small ones, but I cannot understate just how damn huge these trees can eventually grow to be. I mean, I'm currently sitting in one, so they get pretty big. A Douglas fir in what's now Vancouver was measured at about 415 feet. That tree and the entire old growth forest surrounding it was logged in 1902. Five years earlier than that, the Morning Times ran this article about a 465 foot Douglas fir found in Washington's Cascades. Just take a second to picture a 465 foot tall tree. That's almost half the height of the Eiffel Tower. It is ridiculously, stupidly tall. If it's true, that would be the tallest tree ever recorded. And that tree was quickly cut down, used to build about eight houses and displayed in the nearby town of Bellingham. Either or both of those stories could be complete nonsense, but the point is these trees grow to be absolutely massive. And that's why they're so important because a massive tree can store massive amounts of carbon. So let's go back to that Christmas tree. And I'm sorry to roast it, but this guy isn't doing much of anything for the climate. And that's because the amount of carbon a tree stores is proportional to its growth. For the first like decade or so after a tree is planted, it hardly absorbs any. But as the tree's growth accelerates, so does the amount of carbon that it traps. This process is called carbon sequestration. As a tree grows, it takes CO2 gas from the atmosphere and turns it into a solid, which is used to build the tree's structures and stored safely within it. As the tree gets older, eventually that rate of sequestration begins to slow down. And that's why for a while, the general consensus was that once a tree gets old enough, it's not really trapping any new carbon and might as well be cut down, right? But we've only recently realized just how important old trees are for the climate. Even after the rate of carbon capture slows down, all of that CO2 is still stored in the tree. These ancient forests kind of act as like carbon banks, storing massive amounts of CO2. And cutting them down means releasing a lot of that CO2 back into the atmosphere. Carbon that won't be reabsorbed for decades, if not centuries. That's probably the most important part of this, but old growth forests do more than just capture and store carbon. For one, they provide important habitats for threatened species like the spotted owl, and they also protect water sources. 
which is great for both animals, plants, and us. It provides clean drinking water. Old large trees anchor soil, which helps to prevent runoff and floods, and they also regulate precipitation. More rainfall makes old growth forests cool and moist, which fosters plant growth and biodiversity, and that biodiversity in turn makes these forests more resilient to storms and wildfires. Ancient forests don't just slow climate change, they help make the earth better equipped to handle the already changing climate. Not to mention most of these forests hold deep cultural significance for indigenous groups in their respective areas. The Northwest is actually doing a decent job of protecting these forests. A lot of what's left of the old growth in Oregon is protected by either the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management, and logging of old growth trees is pretty rare. So what happened? Well, things got pretty bad. In the early 90s, heavy logging was threatening several species in the Northwest. The Pacific salmon, marbled murrelet, and in particular, the spotted owl. I guess just because he's cute and people didn't want to see him go extinct yet, the spotted owl is kind of the main character of this part of the story and largely responsible for helping these places to get protection. Anyway, a bunch of scientific studies and legal hearings later, it's made pretty clear that something needs to be done about this. And in 1994, the Clinton administration passes the Northwest Forest Plan. It's a 100 year plan governing Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management lands in a lot of Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. The plan has two main goals, the first of which is just to protect what's left of these old forests by limiting logging companies' access to them and preventing clear cutting in particular. Clear cutting is just harvesting all of the trees in an area at the same time. It's arguably the most harmful way to harvest timber. The second is to help replanted areas develop more quickly. That can include thinning, which is just cutting down trees selectively to reduce competition and let trees grow larger. Some old growth areas out here in Oregon are still fair game for logging, and a lot of what's protected is still heavily targeted by the timber industry. And that timber industry is still Oregon's largest source of CO2 emissions, making up about a third of their total emissions each year. Yeah, I don't want to imply that the Northwest Forest Plan is perfect. It definitely isn't. But for now, it's doing its job, making sure that what's left of the Northwest's old growth forests isn't quickly scooped up by the timber industry. Other forests aren't necessarily quite as lucky. Just up the road in British Columbia, giant old trees are just as difficult to find, but about a quarter of the annual timber output still comes from old growth areas. And what makes it particularly unsatisfying is that British Columbia has a pretty large wood pellet industry. So a decent chunk of those trees are just chopped up into wood pellets and burned, which basically just pumps all that carbon right back into the atmosphere. In the Amazon, consistent deforestation has led to extreme unseasonable wildfires and droughts. Look pretty much anywhere in the world and you'll be able to find some story about old growth forests quickly disappearing from the landscape. Arguably the worst part of the disappearance of old growth forests is just its permanence. You could replant trees, but these places take hundreds of years to develop into the lush landscapes that they are. You can plant a tree in the same place, there might still be a forest there, but the towering canopy, the lush forest floor, the biodiversity, all of that is basically gone. And that's why continuing to log these forests just doesn't make much or honestly any sense. I mean, of course logging is necessary, it's important, but it needs to be done sustainably. That includes like cutting trees selectively rather than clear cutting entire areas. It includes replanting areas with an emphasis on biodiversity and helping areas to grow faster and larger. And it honestly should mean just non-negotiably staying the hell away from what's left of these old forests. So a lot of the old trees that you'll find around Oregon are still there and haven't been logged because they're just too much of a pain in the ass to get to. You'll notice right now we're at the bottom of a pretty deep canyon. So most of the trees are pretty old, pretty mossy. It's very old growthy. But you see, once we get up to the top to an area that's a little easier to access, it is not the same story. And now we come to kind of the elephant of the room part of this video. But what about the economy? And well, honestly, it's complicated. It is very, very complicated and I don't want to simplify it in this video. But I think most of us can at least agree that healthy forests and a healthy economy are not mutually 
exclusive. Protecting old growth areas doesn't mean not cutting down a tree ever again. And in the long term, sustainable logging practices help to ensure the survival of local economies. And just because old growth areas aren't being used for timber harvest doesn't mean they're not helping the economy. An interesting statistic I found out while I was writing this video is that the outdoor recreation industry in Oregon, a lot of which takes place on these public lands and forests, generates about 140,000 jobs whereas the timber industry generates about 30,000. Ancient forests are more valuable alive, and they can draw visitors and tourists in a way that a replanted clear cut just can't, because, well, they're gorgeous. Don't forget that. There's a lot of important science and policy surrounding this topic, but let's not glaze over that detail. These forests are ridiculously beautiful. The plants, the colors, the rain and mist, Everything about these places is absolutely magical. You've probably heard forests described as the lungs of the earth because of the carbon they absorb and the oxygen they produce. And it's true. Walking between these trees, you can feel the earth breathe. The landscape feels alive in a way that it just doesn't anywhere else. To me, that's reason enough to hold on to what's left of them. I want to close out with some additional resources in case this video left you wanting to learn more or get involved. The first is one of my favorites. It's this map of protected old growth forests all over the United States. You can use it to find some near you. I actually found a few in North Carolina that I'd never heard of. They're definitely now on the list to check out once I'm back home. That map is made by the Old Growth Forest Network. It's one of several nonprofits, I'll link in the description of this video, that are working to help protect public forests. As far as petitions go, there are old growth forests all over the world. So a quick Google search will give you about a million different ones for different forests, probably some of which are pretty close to you. So I'll also link a few of the articles and interviews that I read while writing this video that I found particularly interesting, some of which contain some really interesting details and information that didn't make it into this video. If you're voting age, you can also just make an effort to vote for people who care about sustainability and the outdoors. Many of the policies I've talked about in this video tend to ebb and flow with changing administration, everything from the presidency down to like the forest service administration. So. Voting for the people to hold public office who care about these things and are going to make them a priority is honestly one of the biggest, most important factors in protecting these areas. And finally, just get out and explore these places for yourself. Um, if nothing else, I hope this video has left you wanting to get out and see something like this on your own. So thank you so much for watching it and I'll see you in the next one.